Dr. Jara Hicks is the co-founder and executive director of the Community Power Agency, a not-for-profit organization supporting communities across Australia in participating in and benefiting from the renewable energy transition. She is also a consumer advocate contributing to the Australian Energy Market Operators Integrated System Plan, which directs Australia's energy transition towards the optimal path for achieving a reliable, affordable, and green energy future. Jara has co-founded and worked for a range of community organizations and social enterprises, from food to energy, advocacy to banking. Jara completed her PhD on the potential for community wind energy projects to contribute positive social, economic, and environmental outcomes for regional communities. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me along today. I really love the idea of the work that you're doing through this network. Very important work, and it, yeah, intersects a lot with the work that I do. So I'm going to talk today about communities, energy, and democracy and the particular role for community-owned renewable energy in the energy transition that is currently underway as we move from more traditional ways of generating electricity through fossil fuels into a much cleaner and, I hope, more democratic um, way of generating energy in the future, which is around renewable energy. One of the things that I really love about renewable energy is that the technology is so different from the ways that we've produced power in the past. And with that comes a whole range of opportunities. And one of the big differences is that it's scalable and modular. And so what that means is, for example, solar panels like the ones on this screen, they can be everything from rooftop on the roof of homes or, you know, childcare centres or um, and through to really large scale solar farms. And this modularity brings the opportunity of participation that hasn't existed before. So in the past where we've had really large coal-fired power generation in one centralised location connected by a really enormous network of um, electricity poles and wires, that doesn't have to be the way we do it anymore. Um, and renewable energy and the scalability of renewable energy opens up so many different opportunities. And for example, already in Australia, we've got three and a half million homes that have solar on their roof. And that's a really enormous contribution to Australia's transition to renewable energy. Um, all up, they're already contributing 32 gigawatts of installed renewable energy capacity, which is a really significant amount of power. And that's been done by households individually taking up that opportunity for not only for cleaner energy, but also for reducing their electricity bills by producing their own energy. And the same goes for wind turbine technology as well. And the, the beauty of renewable energy is it's using natural resources. They're available everywhere. Um, every place will have access to some renewable resource, whether it's from the sun, the wind, the water, or bioenergy. And so you see turbines being used in the same scalable and modular way. You can have a single turbine on the hill. This middle picture here is from Orkney Isles, where I visited, and that single turbine generates the equivalent amount of electricity for the whole um, population of that island, which is 300 people. The scales of renewable energy that we see that are sort of normal in Australia at the moment are this household scale where we've got everything from, you know, a couple of kilowatts, maybe up to 10 kilowatts. We're also seeing more and more happen in the utility scale where we've got really large scale wind and solar farms. And of course, they are really, both of those are really needed within this energy transition. But there's also a real opportunity in the middle here. And this is the space where we work. And that's for community-owned renewable energy projects that are scaled in that mid-range from, say, 10 kilowatts up to 10 megawatts. And when you're doing something at this scale, a whole bunch of new opportunities and new benefits come to the fore. You're doing more than you can do alone in your own home. You're taking action together. And you're, you're able to establish projects that can meet many different needs in your community. So community-owned renewable energy projects, as they're happening, they're happening across the world in lots of different ways. But we can understand them to be projects where communities of place or communities of interest come together to initiate and own a renewable energy project. And together they benefit from the outcomes from that project. And whether that's energy savings or energy generation, or revenue, 
whatever those outcomes are, because it's community owned and community driven, they flow back into the community. These projects take many different forms, but the beauty of them is that they're able to be tailored to the local community, to their resources, to their needs and to their aspirations. So a lot of communities um, might be motivated to take action on climate change and reduce their carbon emissions, or they might be motivated to have uh, a more resilient energy supply or more consistent energy supply. They might be motivated to be self-sufficient or um, to reduce their energy costs. All of these things can be delivered through different forms of projects. The technologies vary a lot. In community energy, we see um, in Australia mostly solar projects, but also some wind projects, micro hydro, um, community and neighbourhood batteries, uh, small scale biogas digesters. There's a whole range of technologies and a whole range of different governance and legal models that can be used to, to set these projects up as well. But just to give you a sense of it, here's some pictures of community energy projects I've visited from a few different countries. This one's on a farm in Germany. Um, this is a community-owned solar farm in Australia, um, a small-scale hydro system in England that's owned by the community. And this is a, a biogas digester that processes crop waste um, from nearby farms to create both heat and electricity in Germany. And this one is one of my favourite projects that I'll talk about in a bit more detail in a moment called Hepburn Energy down in Dalesford in Victoria in Australia. But ultimately these projects, um, what's unique about community energy projects is that they are as much about the approach that you take, the way that you involve people, the opportunities you create for participation along the way to setting up the physical structures and the actual technology that you're seeking to establish. So in essence, they are community development projects. Um, and we all know the value of um, building our social fabric, building our connections with each other, um, building our understanding of how we can organise together, how we can address the issues in our communities that are concerning us and how we, if, if we're able to do that together, that that can be such an empowering experience and it can build skills and connections that are generative and that help us to be more resilient, not just on energy, but on you know, a whole range of issues in the community. So in community energy projects, we the work that we do with communities is helping them to think through, what are the processes? Let's think through, who is this project developed and run by? Who is it, who is it benefiting? Who is it for? Who is involved and included in the decision making? And how can we open that up? How can we make energy, how can we open up energy as a space where communities can actually make decisions about the future of the energy system they want to see and where they want that energy coming from? How can we um, increase the power and influence that everyday people have on their, you know, their energy bills? And um, how can we make our projects inclusive so that we can reach out to a lot of people? But also thinking, of course, about the outcomes, it is ultimately, you know, about renewable energy. Um, you know, what's the technology we're going to use? What's the scale? What makes sense in this community? What are you trying to achieve? Um, and thinking through how are the benefits going to flow, you know, economically back into the community. So in summary, in just this introduction section of my talk around community, what you know, so the theory of community-owned renewable energy, we can think of it as having four essential elements. They help us to decarbonize by using renewable energy and lowering our carbon emissions. They help us to decentralize and localize our energy supply, which helps us be more mindful of our energy source and our energy use. And um, they also democratize the governance by involving people in ownership and participation. And all of these things help to demonstrate that renewable energy technologies work. They help to demystify the technology, help people to understand the energy transition that's happening, help it to become a familiar rather than a scary um, proposition. So I just wanted to introduce you to a couple of case studies as well. Um, this project is um, Hep Hepburn Energy. It was the first operating community-owned renewable energy project in Australia. And it's a very, remains a super inspiring project for me. It's, um, it's a two turbine project um, together. 
It's a 4.2 megawatt wind farm, and they generate enough power to supply the equivalent of 2,300 homes, which is a pretty significant contribution um, in terms of electricity generation. And this project was set up by a cooperative of local people. There's over 2,000 people involved in the co-op. Most of them are local people. And together they did everything that needed to happen to organise this really significant infrastructure project and connect it into the national grid. They raised the money from their members um, and from a bank loan to be able to build the project. Um, and the project has now been running for over 10 years. And it feeds electricity into the national grid and the cooperative sells that power and gets an income from the sale of that power. And with their income, they're able to support other local sustainable energy initiatives, as well as paying a return back to their members. So each year, this project's able to work with their community and provide funding for what has become a ripple effect through the local area. Um, so they've been able to work with other local organisations and the local government in their area to work towards the whole shire becoming net zero energy, not just for electricity, but also for heat and for um, land use emissions and across the whole board. They've done things like have an electric vehicle bulk buy program to bring the cost of electric vehicles down. They've installed electric vehicle chargers and done education, They've done energy efficiency programs. Um, and now they're adding a five megawatt solar farm and a 10 megawatt hour battery to the project. So they've really been able to look holistically and, and over the years do so many different programs with their community. And importantly, I think one of the really essential elements of the project is remembering the value of celebration and of bringing people together and of allowing people opportunities to really experience the technology. Um, in Australia at the moment, some people are quite concerned about new large-scale wind farms um, coming to their neighbourhood. It's not something they have any experience with um, and they are really big structures and so they are, you know, they're, they're quite overwhelming at first if you've never experienced one. But having the opportunity to go and just to be present with the turbines, to do that in a joyful way as part of a celebration, as you can see in this photo, is it's a really powerful thing and it's a community building thing. I also wanted to share another example called the Haystack Solar Garden. This is a project that my organisation led. And one of the key things we need to consider as we go through this energy transition is how we can open up ownership, how we can make sure that there's equity and justice um, and that the energy system we're working towards is more just and more fair than the current system. And so this project really sought to address the barrier that many households are currently experiencing in Australia, where if you rent or if you live in an apartment, you can't own your own rooftop solar. And so you don't have the ability to access that, um, the, the cost savings and, you know, the ability to control your energy prices that you can get if you have solar on your own roof. And this project allowed our members to buy a plot in a solar farm we helped to build a solar farm um, and then we encouraged people to buy plots in the solar farm and the electricity generated from their portion of that solar farm gets credited directly onto their energy bill. So it mimics having rooftop solar without someone having to own their own roof. So they're just two examples of what community energy projects can look like. Um, but there's now over, over 700 operating community energy projects across Australia, which is really exciting. But even more exciting is that these projects are actually all over the world. And I just a couple of examples that I've, I've picked. A fantastic organisation in Indonesia called Ibeka has installed community-owned microhydro and solar systems in over 450 villages across Indonesia over the last 15 years, which is just a phenomenal and amazing effort. You can imagine how many people's lives that is changing through providing um, electricity access where there was none before, through providing more reliable power and doing it in a way that builds community participation, empowerment and ownership along the way. I've also visited examples of community-owned renewable energy microgrids um, with solar and batteries in Cambodia um, as a way of bringing electricity to areas where the national grid can't reach because they're simply too remote community-owned renewable energy has a real role to play there. 
So we're seeing a lot of benefits from the possibilities of democratizing energy um, and through enabling people to become active agents in this energy system change that's underway. Um, and there's a whole there's a whole range of benefits that that come from that. Um, but I think one of the important ones is this idea that through acting together, uh, we're able to build our understanding of how how to work together and how to, you know, do democracy in action. Those are really, really important skills, I think, um, going into a world where there are a lot of issues that that we do need to address together. I also just wanted to say, of course, it's not all easy. <laughs> there are a lot of there are a lot of barriers and a lot of challenges along the way. Um, and what we, we've seen work well is where governments can establish um, can recognise the unique role of community-owned renewable energy in addition to household and utility scale projects um, and where governments can establish enabling policies and support programs. That doesn't currently exist very much in Australia and in many countries in the world. Um, and so my organisation is part of advocating for programs and conditions to increase the space um, and the ability for communities to act as part of this energy transition, recognising that they have an important role to play alongside the household scale and the utility scale action that are already well established. Um, that's my contact details. If you're interested to know more, there's our website as well. Oh, I will also just mention on this slide, um, we've got a current campaign going for local energy hubs, which it would be an Australian-wide programs supporting communities to participate in the energy transition through community energy projects, but also through a range of other programs. Um, and if you're interested in that, that's the website there. Thanks.